Elementary music teacher friend, you love what you do, but you might feel unappreciated and, in fact, unseen some days. You may even feel like you're on a music teacher island and just want to connect with other music teachers who can relate to both your struggles and wins when it comes to teaching elementary music. I get you and understand completely the feelings you're having. That's why each and every week, the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast will provide you with solo and guest episodes that will help you realize you're not alone in your music teaching journey. Throughout each episode, my goal is for you to be able to walk away with actionable steps and ideas to help you feel like you're ready to take on the new week with whatever challenges may be thrown your way. Hi, I'm your host, Jessica Peresta, and I'm so glad you're here. Whether you're at home, in your car, in the shower, or wherever else you're listening, grab your cup of coffee or whatever other beverage is nearby and listen in to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. I'm Anne, co-host of Transparency in Teaching, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey friend, I'm so excited you're here today. We are going to talk about following a roadmap for curriculum development. A roadmap is a map. Basically, it is how do you start from this point until and how do you get to the point you're going to think about a car trip. Uh, We are taking one soon to Louisiana from Arkansas and we will be in the car as a family of five, which is a good and bad thing, I guess. But (laughs) we we have a map to follow. Right. And back in the day, it was a paper map. And now our phones, thanks to Google Maps, will help guide us where we need to go. But I would not be able to get to there without following a map. I, those people that can just do that, I'm blown away. Like, wow, how do you just know what highway to just jump on without, you know, having something to help you navigate? And so that's what a roadmap is. And this ties in perfectly to curriculum development where, okay, I know I want to create a curriculum for my music room. I already follow this particular curriculum or I already follow this curriculum map. Or I pull from a lot of different resources, but how do I design it and curate it in a way that makes sense for my music room? And that's where roadmap comes into play. And so if you came to the workshop I just hosted the past two nights about curriculum design and simplifying lesson planning, we talked all about this. And if you did not come, well, you're in luck because today on the podcast, I'm going to touch on what I spoke about in the workshop, but in a simplified way, because we were there for an hour and I like to keep my podcast shorter than an hour. And so stick with me because I'm going to talk to you about what you can do to be a great curriculum designer for your music room. So to start off with, we're going to talk about backwards planning. And if you listened to last week's podcast episode, this was my final point about talking about how assessment and lesson planning go hand in hand. And I talked talked about in backwards planning, assessment comes first. So let's say the first point of your roadmap is backwards planning. It's keeping the bigger picture in mind for the year, quarter, month, week, days, and class period. So notice I started with a whole year and we worked all the way backwards until we got to individual class periods. And it, this is, when you think about backwards planning, it is uh, instead of planning week to week, you are knowing what you're going to be teaching the entire school year and then breaking it down into chunks and in units, lessons and assessments around that. It's also knowing where you want to go each nine weeks and what you're going to do to get your students there. So what standards are you following? Some of you listening might be following the national music standards. Some might be following state standards, whatever state you live in. Some of you don't live in the U.S. and you have your own standards from your own country that you follow. And some of you, if you're like me, I taught in a large district Tulsa Public Schools provided us district music standards they wanted us to follow. And as you're very well aware, the standards are very different. When you look at the national music standards, they are laid out and organized in a different way, in different language than 
if let's say your state is giving you music standards to follow. I know for me, the district ones I followed, they already broke down into nine weeks what they wanted us to do with our students. All transparency, okay? I didn't always do that. <laughs> Sometimes I would extend concepts I wanted to teach to my students past a certain nine weeks or would move things around in a way that made sense for me. But if you're following, let's say the national music standards, you know, it's just like, teach this. And you're like, well, when, how, where, who, how long? Like, and you're having to just kind of figure it out on your own. So knowing where you want to go each nine weeks, this is backwards planning helps with this. You are saying, okay, here are the standards. They're not telling me when to teach this. But I need to decide when I'm teaching this concept and skill to my students. And so you need to know if they're already broken down into nine weeks for you or if you're going to need to kind of figure that out and create a scope and sequence on your own. Backwards planning is also having a scope and sequence to follow, which I kind of just talked about. And whether you're creating your own or using an already made one. Begin filling in standards and concepts you're going to be focusing on each month and then start creating lesson plans around the curriculum map. So the second step of having a roadmap to follow when it comes to curriculum curriculum development is knowing your desired results. So what is the goal of the lesson? What, what goal are you covering? And I touched on this in a podcast episode a couple weeks ago, but don't just plan lessons to say you planned a lesson but know what you want your students to know at the end of the unit and how you're going to check for understanding. I've said this before, but there should always be a rhyme to your reason. There should always be a reason behind anything you're doing in your music room, whether you're teaching a lesson or assessing your students. There should always be a reason. So know what the goal of a particular lesson is. Don't just willy-nilly it and just pull it out of thin air and say, "Mm, I'm teaching this today because I need to teach something. No, have a reason behind it. And also when we're talking about the desired results is planning with the end goal in mind while thinking about desired results in your students, what is the end goal with planning this lesson or unit is the goal for them to know or retain a concept is the goal for them to learn something before moving into a new unit. So just think about that. What is the goal here? And this helps with your, on your roadmap for curriculum development, this I would say is step two is knowing the desired results of what you're wanting your students to grasp. Now, this next point is a whole episode I did last week about uh, set, thinking about assessment before planning. I include that included that in this episode, but assessment ideas that are more than a quiz is the first point I want to talk about, and I did not talk about that last week. So in this episode, I'm going to give you a few assessment ideas that maybe you have not thought of, or maybe you have thought of these, but they're just kind of reminders for you. So I'm going to give you just some examples here. If the goal is for students to retain what they're learning and to truly understand the concepts being taught, we need to rethink the way students are assessed, right? There's nothing wrong with a test or quiz. But are students using higher order thinking skills while taking these types of assessments? And if they are, then great. But if it's just a quiz that's yes or no answers or just multiple choice that has one word listed or true false, they're not really using higher order thinking skills. And a lot of times those quizzes aren't really effective at really assessing where your students are. So here's some ideas for you. I told you I was going to give you examples. Collaborating in small groups. I think it's huge in the music room, especially for your upper elementary kiddos. Creating something together. When they're able to create and do hands-on activities, they are really retaining what they're learning because they're experiencing music and not just sitting and learning it. Are they able to present ideas? Maybe they're able to present, I don't know, uh, um, they're they're te- able to teach their other students something and they're presenting ideas to other students, put them in a leadership capacity. Are they able to ask questions in a deeper way? Are they able to, you're planning assessments in order to help them do that? Or are they doing an interactive assignment? This can definitely be something on technology where you're integrating technology into a lesson and they're able to do an interactive assignment with other classmates. Uh, assessments for you and the students become a lot more fun when we move past just quizzes and tests, which we know in the music room, you don't do a ton of those, but you do some. So think of 
assessment ideas that are fun and that you're maybe you're thinking outside of the box, which, oh my gosh, I, I do that all the time. Right. And you're, you're not just doing things the way everybody else does it, but you're, you're like, oh my gosh, I heard that this teacher in their classroom did this certain assessment where for a math activity, I could do something like that in the music room. How could I adapt it to fit what I'm doing in here? So I would constantly just keep a running Google Doc of notes you're keeping about different assessment ideas you find or hear about or think about and just kind of go. And when you have time, which we know is never, but when you do have extra time, think about how you can make that work in your music classroom. And we already touched on this, but rethink the way you view assessment. Assessment is much more than just the grade you give your students right? We talked about last week on last week's episode. It's not just tacking on assessment to the end of a lesson, but really it should be ongoing and embedded into everything you do in the music room. Assessment is also checking for understanding, but it's allowing students to do self-assessment and reflection as well. Give them time to process what they're doing in the music room and how they're doing it. And that is going to help them to really use those higher order thinking skills in order to assess themselves and also give them opportunities to share their work and ideas with their classmates. This is so important. I think collaboration should be a huge part of what goes on in the music room. And I know you're already doing that a lot as well. So when we're on this roadmap for curriculum development, I also want to talk on talk about having a system in place for how you're designing curriculum and planning lessons. When you have a system in place for planning, here ideas could include Google Drive. And I'm going to use that as as an example, because although I do use Microsoft Office and Microsoft 365, I Google is kind of like my BFF. So that's what I have used the most and what I'm the most comfortable with. But Google Drive works great when you're designing a system for lesson planning and for curriculum and keeping everything organized and together. Because speaking of organizing, you can organize everything into folders and sync up your Google Docs, slides, and sheets. You can keep a list of activities and assessments and lessons that you want to easily plug and play into your planning based around that scope and sequence we talked about earlier in the episode. Set aside time to work backwards, whether over the summer, on a weekend, or during break. So when we talked about backwards planning, and you're like, oh my gosh, that seems like such a daunting task. Like, how am I supposed to sit down and look at the entire year? It is time extensive, I would say. But once you've done it, lesson planning is going to go so much smoother for you when you just take the time and block out that time somewhere where you're like, I'm going to sit down and really plan out how long I'm going to spend on activities and concepts in the school year. And then I'm going to work backwards and knowing how I'm going to assess and how I'm going to teach students based upon this long range plan I have developed. While looking at your scope and sequence after you've created it or figured out which one you're using, that's when you go into brainstorming ideas for lessons and activities that would work well for teaching that concept. So have a system for planning, both with organizing your lesson plans, but also where you're having a system for planning when it comes to how are you going to backwards plan and then fill in the lessons according to that. I also want to talk about know what works for you. When we're on this roadmap of curriculum development, know yourself, know your personality, know what works for you. It doesn't have to work for anyone else. Just because a particular curriculum, another teacher, or even an instructional coach tells you to teach a concept a certain way doesn't mean it's the way. I really want to encourage you to realize that. This is something that it's hard to do. When someone is telling you to teach a certain concept or do this song this way or do this folk dance this way and you're like, eh, it's not really my cup of tea so much. It's okay to think that way. It's okay to do it your way. You have a unique personality and sometimes it's about trusting your gut and thinking outside of the box. Stay flexible and know your students' needs. Your students are your students. They're going to each have different needs and you will also need lessons differentiated. That's a hard word to say, isn't it? Based upon their learning styles, academic needs, emotional needs, and based on the way you best teach. We've talked about this a million times on this podcast. When I've had those episodes about lesson planning, 
that even the best plan lessons don't end up working well sometimes. On paper, it looks great, but when you try to teach it in front of real life human beings, sometimes you get these like crazy looks or it's just not going the way you in your head envision it going. And that is okay. And that's why keeping track of data and keeping track of those moments and knowing how to improve that for next time is super important. That's when we talked about how your scope and sequence and when you're backwards planning, it is an evolving, breathing, living thing that is constantly being adjusted and modified. It's never set in stone. You're always able to adjust and adapt as needed. And the last thing I want to touch on is simplifying the planning process. First thing is use what you already have. Instead of going out and trying to find all the new books, resources, materials, websites, apps, and so on, use what you already have available. Start with what's in your classroom. Maybe you have tons of resources and books already shelved and you've never really taken the time to go through and look through them. Do that. Do that first. Do that first. Then you can slowly start adding on to that. Make a list of activities and lessons and think about what you have that you can already use and plan with right now. If you're overwhelmed collecting all the new resources and apps and websites and books and all the things that are out there, then don't do it. Start with what you have first. When you sit down to plan, I want you to make a schedule of what to do during plan time. This sounds kind of like, what? What do you mean? (laughs) This is like pretty uh, a concept that I started implementing and it really worked well because I would sit there and go, okay, do I lesson plan today? Am I working on my program speaking parts? Am I, am I really going to uh, enter grades in? What, what am I doing today? What am I doing? So have a t- time, have a plan for what you do when you sit down to lesson plan. Let's talk about that. Let's unpack that a little bit. When you sit down to plan, maybe have something different you do each day. Of course, this is going to vary week by week, but look at an upcoming unit, break it down by weeks, then by days, then think about assessment opportunities. And when you're breaking it down the way I just described, each day of the week, you could be doing something different. So Monday might be looking at an upcoming unit, brainstorming ideas, opening up those Google Docs we just talked about and adding to it. And then maybe Tuesday, you're deciding, okay, um, how am I going to teach this? How many weeks do I need to spend on this concept or unit? Then you're going to start actually developing the lesson plan and looking at assessment ideas and plugging them in. And you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So if you are stuck, this is when collaboration opportunities with other teachers comes into play. This is when you can use ideas on Teachers Pay Teachers and then go and find new ideas if you've already exhausted the ideas you already have available to you and the resources we talked about looking at. This is when going to your scope and sequence and really looking at the what you're teaching when you're teaching it comes into play because you'll know when to find new resources. You're going to know when you need to go out and look for new lesson ideas and know what you should purchase next. It's not just going to be, oh, another book to add to my shelf, but it's going to be like, actually, I need, I need more advice and resources about this particular concept. So some bonus tips I want to talk about is Focus on your unique teaching situation and your students. Don't compare what you're doing to any other teacher. Be open to advice and constructive criticism and know your teaching style and be comfortable being you. That is so important to be comfortable being you because if you're not comfortable being yourself, your students will feed off of that and will be very aware of that fact. So I want you to be comfortable being yourself and know that how important that really is. So maybe you're listening to this episode and you're like, but what if I can't plan a curriculum effectively? You hear me, you understand what I'm saying, but you're like, this sounds so overwhelming. And I have been really wanting to develop a curriculum for my classroom for a while, but I'm just really not sure how, or I don't have the time to put into it. And I completely hear you. So I want to say to you, you only need to design your curriculum one time 
to be successful. You can use the same framework year after year with your students. So once it's done, it's done. And you get to just go in each year and the lesson planning process becomes way simpler. If you want me to help be your mentor and guide, I invite you to join me for the Curriculum Design Roadmap course. This is the complete guide to helping elementary music teachers plan curriculum with ease. This is the only training of its kind, and it shows you exactly how to confidently create curriculum for your elementary music classroom so you can move away from feeling overwhelmed in lesson planning each week. I want to talk to you about what is in here. We will talk about and put into action using the right instructional model, how to backwards plan, creating a scope and sequence, using and finding resources, ways to plan for different grade levels, how to structure your class time, ways to rethink assessment, and much, much more. By the end of this program, you are going to know about curriculum design, including what your fears are when it comes to designing curriculum for your music classroom, how to move beyond them, why curriculum design works, and how to choose an instructional model. You're going to know how to backwards plan and long range plan, including what backwards planning is, how to create your own curriculum map and scope and sequence. And I'm going to help you with that and provide templates in order to do so. You're going to have ways to organize your teaching content, including steps to finding resources, creating a songs and activities list by objectives and different folders and organizational systems to consider. You're going to have ways to plan for different grade levels, including lower and elementary ideas, sequencing instruction each year, and structuring your class time, and assessment ideas that work. We're going to talk about including how to read the language of the objectives, collecting and analyzing data, informal and formal assessment ideas, and new ideas you can implement. This course has two ways you can enroll. You can join as a student and get everything I listed, plus the bonuses I'm going to talk about in just a minute, or you can join as a VIP member and you will also get a curriculum and lesson planning audit with me one-on-one, as well as a one-on-one coaching call with me, and you will be sent the links to enroll and to sign up for both of those things. Bonuses in this course also include five weeks of live question and answers with me. The course closes on March 23rd, and everything starts on March 27th. You're also going to get a PDF resource that breaks down specific ways to integrate technology in your music classroom for both lower and upper elementary students. You're also going to get a bonus called the Google Drive System Starter Kit that gives you a complete organizational system you can copy and make your own to help you lesson plan with ease. So to repeat, you get five implementation modules that will teach you how to create a curriculum that you and your students love. You're going to get a deep dive into instructional design and how to choose the model that fits with your teaching style. You're going to get systems to help you organize your lesson plans in a seamless and easy to understand way. You're going to also get an exclusive community of other music educators who will support you throughout the course and a song and activity ideas list for lower and upper elementary grades that include assessment ideas that work. This course is something that's been on my heart for a long time, and I'm so excited to get it into the world, and I can't wait to support you if this is something you are needing. If you're wanting your time outside of school hours back, and you're not afraid of putting in the work, and you know there's no perfect time to achieve your goals, then this course is 100% for you. So simply head to jessicaparesta.teachable.com forward slash P forward slash curriculum design roadmap, or simply click on the link in the show notes. And I can't wait to see you in there. Let me know if you have any questions and I hope that you received value from this episode and you are well on your way to following that roadmap to curriculum design. 
Well, hey there. Thank you so much for listening into the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. There is an exclusive Facebook group just for listeners of this podcast and any elementary music teacher called the Elementary Music Teacher Community Facebook Group. Come on over and join us there where we have conversations around the podcast episodes and encourage each other each and every week. And also head to my website, thedomesticmusician.com. I have some free resources there that you can download to help you gain traction in your classroom today as well as the blog and the membership site and all kinds of other goodies to help you keep going in your music teaching journey. I cannot wait to keep connecting with you and encouraging you and spurring you on in your journey of teaching elementary music. Hang in there, have an amazing week, and I will see you soon.